All right, now before we can print anything on the printer, we need to get the roller extensions on the machine. The uh, first one is the, the one for the front. This is the, the larger, it's the wide, not wider, but, but thicker uh, roller extension. That goes on the front. You've got these tabs on the end. They go into the slots, come down at an angle, and then it will drop down into place. For the rear, basically the same thing. The rear one is the the more petite one. We'll go ahead and take that. We go ahead and take these tabs and lift them up above the posts, come down at an angle, and it'll drop down into place. To plug power in for the DTG Viper, the power plug is located in the back of the machine beneath the conveyor belt plug the power cord into the power receptor next to the red power switch and the USB cord will plug into the USB printer slot with the red circle around it then to power the machine on press the red power switch down Because of the dummy cartridges not being uh, genuine Epson uh, ink chips, when the machine powers up, we get this non-genuine message. If we press the forward, that'll scroll down through the message. It says, non-genuine cartridge may not perform at optimum. Do you continue? And then it, it's asking you to press the left key for yes or the right arrow key, which is menu for no. We're going to go ahead and say yes to accept. Then it says damage from cartridge is not warranted. Now this is Epson's message, not DTG. This does not affect your DTG warranty. It says do you accept this, accept or decline. We'll hit select or the left arrow key to accept. And now the printer will continue to power up as normal. When we're doing things from the control panel, like running head cleaning cycles or doing nozzle checks, they're the only things that we need to use the control panel for uh, in the menu settings uh, on DTG. The Epson settings that are available here in these menu settings um, are components that are no longer present in the Viper itself, so uh, you want to avoid making any changes to these types of settings. If any of these settings get changed, you could get the printer going into an error mode um, because it can't find the component that, that did exist in the Epson printer. Now let's press menu button. We'll see printer setup. There's no need to go into printer setup and, and change any of these settings. We press forward key. We'll scroll down to test print. In a minute, I'll talk about test print. That's where we come to do nozzle checks. Under printer status, we don't need to go in here for any reason. Under custom paper, again, there's no reason to go in here. There's no paper in this printer. There's no sensors for paper. Uh, the settings are set for defaults, and we do not change them. Under maintenance, the only reason we'd come here is 
is for a power clean. Uh, that's really the only thing we need under maintenance. Under head alignment, this is not anything you want to do without the help of a technician. A head alignment is a very difficult procedure that requires time, requires printing samples over and over again that you have to choose the best ones. Um, because there's white ink in this printer, it's a little bit more difficult and you do need the help of a DTG tech. Under network setup, you don't need to go in here for any reason. You're not using this printer on a network. Under cutter replacement, this printer doesn't even have a cutter so there's no need to set any settings for cutter replacement. Uh, now we're back to printer setup so we've gone through all the listings. If you need to back out of the menu you press select key that'll bring us back to ready. Be careful not to press select too many times. Uh, if you back out of the menu and then keep pressing select you will start changing your paper mode from roll sheet to sheet mode or to roll with a cut and we need to be in in roll mode only. All right, the ink pods that uh, come with the machine connect to the printer with these hinges. They go on very simple. Here's our color, CMYK. And on the other side here, we've got our uh, white ink uh, circulation system. The, uh, the white ink circulation system will be separate and not connected. It has uh, two bluers that allow us to disconnect and connect. One end is a male, the other end is a female, therefore they can only be connected the proper way. And they just simply screw into the lures. Uh, just screw them snug tight. You don't have to crank them down tight. They will seal with a snug tight fit. The power supply will plug in just like that. Now to go ahead and put ink in our circulation system, we'll go ahead and unscrew the cap you can lay it aside here shake your white ink bottle good before pouring the uh, white ink into the canister let's go ahead and take the the cap for the uh, white ink canister Make sure you get the tubes to go down in. Of course, if you don't have the tubes in place, you won't be able to get the cap screwed on. It is easier, rather than try to screw the cap on, you can turn the canister to, to get the cap to screw on tight. Don't need to screw it on tight, just get it down snug. On the pod for the white ink circulation system, you've got two dials. These dials are for the uh, stirrer that comes down from the cap. You've got your rest dial and your stir dial. Your rest dial is for how long it, it stays turned off. The numbers represent hours. Uh, we should go ahead and set it for three. This means that the paddle will be turned off for three hours. The stir time is represented in minutes. This is how long the paddle stirs for. Uh, go ahead and set that to 10, meaning every three hours the paddle's going to come on and stir for 10 minutes. All right, now let's go ahead and fill the CMYK bottles up. Go ahead and unscrew. We can start with black here. The colors are marked on the tube with a little black collar or a little cyan collar, magenta, yellow, and so forth. Take your, your black bottle here and unscrew. The bottles for the Vipers usually come in 8 ounce bottles. The bottles on the machine themselves are also 8 ounces. Go ahead and fill that all the way up. Then we can go ahead and take the, the cap for the machine, get the tube back in, and just like the white ink bottle, we can, we can turn the bottle and hold the uh, cap in one place to screw it down. We do need to make sure that we screw these down snug tight because the bottles will be pressurized. Right, next we'll move on to the cyan just like we did with the black. Go ahead and get the two back in and get the cap screwed on.
and then we'll go ahead and move on to the magenta and then finally we've got yellow to fill go ahead and get your magenta place back on there get the cap screwed on before starting Now we also have on these tubes these little uh, lock clamps that will pinch the tube shut. So before we do any ink charge we need to make sure they're in the up position. It's open. If we have it rolled down that'll have the tube pinched shut. We need to make sure they're in the up position before we, we start the charge ink. So go ahead and plug the, the power cord into the back of the machine that's located in the rear underneath the conveyor belt. Plug the power cord in here and then go ahead and press the red power switch down. We'll, to stop the WIMS unit from circulating, all we need to do is simply unplug the uh, power unit. The cord that comes down from the bottom of the WIMS unit plugs into the cord that comes up from the bottom corner. Okay, now that we have ink in the printer, we're ready to charge the printer with ink. We do this by doing a power cleaning. So we press menu, go ahead and press forward to scroll through the settings. We want to find maintenance and we'll press menu to select. Then press forward again to scroll through the selections under maintenance. When we find power cleaning, we go ahead and press menu. Uh, right now it's telling us that we're going to have to raise and lower the levers by the cartridges. Uh, during this procedure and it's also asking us if we want to perform this procedure or not we have yes on the right side and no on the left side menu button is also the right arrow key select is the left arrow key press menu to select yes and now procedure starts we want to watch the control panel here because it's going to tell us when we need to raise those ink levers and when we need to lower them when it says raise levers we need to come around to the back side of the machine and at the same time raise both levers at the same time raise both levers The Viper bed and conveyor belt will feed the platen into the printer unit and we control this bed unit by the up and down buttons and the forward and reverse. If we press forward this will make the conveyor belt go forward into the printer. If we press reverse this will bring the conveyor belt back. Up and down, we'll press up, we'll bring the whole conveyor system uh, rollers and all up and then press down to take them back down. And load button here actually is how we load the platen. We'll show that in a second here. To load the platen, we're going to lift it up by its handles and lay it down partially on the conveyor belt and partially on the front extension rollers. 
we want to make sure that this rail here is all the way up against the black rail of the machine itself since we're working on the control panel side we can you know make sure that it's flush on this side on the opposite side there will be a little bit of a gap but that's alright if the platen's cocked like this then uh, as it works itself or feeds itself into the printer it'll actually work itself out during printing and then of course when it comes to do a color layer that'll give us a registration issue now what we want to do next is bring the uh, platen forward we press forward and bring it into the first part of the machine that way it's in close enough to actually be detected by the laser sensor press up hold it and once the uh, platen gets up to the sensor it's actually going to detect the platen in its surface and then it'll set the proper gap now the machine automatically set it so our final step for loading the platen is to press load this will actually put the platen in the uh, precise starting position so that the top of the page is where the printer actually stops so the top of the page is where the printer actually starts printing if the platen isn't all the way in the load position the printer will actually start printing before the platen has even come in underneath the print head best thing to use for a nozzle check is something like transparency film uh, you can get this at any office supply store you want to place it in the upper left hand corner of the platen and have about a quarter of an inch coming off of it and and have it just a little bit off the top of the platen go ahead and press forward to bring the platen into the gap sensor then press up and hold it until it detects the platen and sets the gap now press load once in place press menu press forward to scroll down and choose test print then choose nozzle check then choose print now the printer is going to go ahead and automatically print the nozzle check on the transparency film okay now when printing the nozzle check the platen does not eject back out so when it finishes and we have a green light for ready just press reverse that'll bring it part of the way out and then we can gently pull the platen the rest of the way out and remove our transparency film to perform the nozzle check on a viper once we have the platen loaded we press menu and we press the forward button to scroll down we'll see test print and we want to choose menu then we see nozzle check we press menu again to choose the nozzle check we'll see print then we press menu one more time to actually select the nozzle check the control panel will then tell us that it's printing and we will see the printer print the nozzle check now with the nozzle check and the pattern that we get we get for every single channel of the print head or every color uh, a block that's filled with dashes and these dashes stair step down now every dash represents a nozzle and anywhere where we see a, a dash missing or a bunch of dashes missing that means that we have nozzles that didn't fire for either being clogged or they're not completely primed and they just fired air as we scan across this nozzle check that we just printed we see that actually our colors look pretty good I think we've got one break in the black and uh, cyan magenta and yellow look real good and then of course as we get across to our whites we see they're they're pretty shoddy they they've got quite a few nozzles that didn't fire so that tells us right there we need to uh, do another head cleaning cycle and then repeat the nozzle check to perform a head cleaning cycle on the Viper we simply press and hold the menu button down for about three seconds or so that'll initiate the cleaning cycle uh, which it'll continue to do on its own 
Now you can initiate a head cleaning cycle at any time with the printer. Uh, even if it's in the middle of printing, you can still press and hold that menu button down and it'll initiate a head cleaning cycle and then it'll resume uh, printing as soon as the head cleaning cycle is done. Now we know we've done enough head cleanings when we see a nozzle check that looks more like this. As we go across we see we don't have any breaks. All the dashes are there. They're all stair stepping down like they should be. Uh, this tells us that all nozzles are firing and we are ready to print when we see a nozzle check like this. Now, even though the DTG Viper has a bulking system with bottles on the back of the machine um, that we fill up with ink and refill with ink, there's still the Epson part of the printer that has a, a need to see an ink cartridge. Uh, there's a chip on an Epson ink cartridge that tells the printer how much ink is left in the cartridge and, and when the printer is going to run out. So the Epson still needs to see this. These cartridges on the Viper are just dummy cartridges. They don't provide ink, but they do have the chip that counts down the amount of ink. They're going to run out of ink or they're going to tell the printer that they've run out of ink and they need to be reset. The Viper came with a resetter that we can use to reset these. In here are the actual dummy cartridges that have the chip on them. You lift up the lever here and pull out the first cartridge. Here's the chip that actually tells the printer that there is ink in this cartridge and how much ink is in the cartridge. When it thinks it's run out or when the chip has count down, we use this resetter and we line the pins of the resetter up with the, the contacts on the actual ink chip there's a slot on the chip resetter that goes right into this groove on the cartridge and we line that up press it down the pins will go in the light will blink it will blink red when it blinks to green the chip is reset you can go ahead and put the cartridge back in its slot now be careful putting these cartridges in the slot you don't want to slam them in or jam them in hard you just want to gently slide them in we could damage the contacts inside now once we have all four reset you can lower the lever and it'll lock them in place. Now just like the ink cartridges, um, there is also a maintenance tank on an Epson printer and it also has an ink chip that tells the printer uh, how much uh, waste ink is going in there. Now of course the Viper's got a separate tank that we we check visually and dump when we need to. Now in the back of the printer here you'll find this little knob, this little door here. Pull the knob out and that will unlock the door and now you can swing the door open and inside is the dummy waste tank. Now you go ahead and reach in there and pull it out like a drawer and you will find on the side here an ink chip just like the one on the cartridge. Now same thing we use the same resetter line up the pins with the contacts on the chip press it down we'll see the light blink once it goes green that's reset now and we can put it back in and now the printer knows that the waste tank has been reset. Now go ahead and close the door. Now sometimes after putting the maintenance tank back in after you've reset it, you still might see the message on the control panel say no MNT tank or no maintenance tank. Uh, what's happened is the dummy waste tank has been put back in but the chip is not making a good contact. Uh, so just simply go back to the uh, tank, pull it out and gently push it back in. You may need to repeat this a couple of times but that will eventually get the ink chip to be recognized by the contacts. When we're putting a shirt on the platen, there's really no precise place to actually put it. It's basically about where you want to place the graphic. Now you can put the shirt on on uh, with the collar at the top of the platen, especially if you're trying to print something really wide. Quite often people will actually, uh, when they're doing standard prints, they'll, they'll put the shirt on here sideways and they will actually rotate the graphic to accommodate that. Now what we want to do here, put the shirt down on the board and get the collar just off the edge and use the bottom mark of the collar as your center guideline. 
Then down at the bottom, grab the excess material and just kind of pull it up. Make sure you get the same amount of fabric on both sides. That'll ensure we're not skewed on there. Um, now we can go ahead and start tucking. Uh, we really don't want to touch the surface of the shirt now. We want to we want to keep the nap flat, uh, especially with dark shirts. Now we want to go ahead and start tucking things in the grip by tucking on the opposite side. So in other words, if you're tucking on top, you should be tucking on the bottom as well. Same from side to side. Tuck from side to side uh, to help counter and pull the shirt flat across the platen. We want to make sure we get any wrinkles out of there. Any of the excess material of the shirt that's coming out of the tuck lock can just be tucked underneath the tuck locks. We also want to look closely at the corners to make sure that they're not flaring up uh, at the very points of the corners. Now once we got the shirt on there we can go ahead and, and get our platen set up make sure we're up against the rail uh, good and flat. Now we go ahead and press forward it'll come in. Now in this case it was already higher than the actual sensor so the sensor started to lower the the platen to get the right gap. Uh, in some cases you might actually be lower and need to press up to bring it up to the gap. Uh, pretty much every time you uh, load a printer you wanna press the up button to make sure that it's that it's up during printing if the sensor detects something it will lower just a little bit so go ahead and make it a habit to always press up every time you load a new shirt just to make sure your gap is up and at the right place alright now we'll go ahead and press load and send it on in if it detects anything else it will lower it down now while it's loading in and the sensor scanning across there uh, if it does detect a wrinkle further down in the shirt it will lower the platen down to protect the print head which of course will give us a uh, inconsistent gap so that's why it's very important to make sure we don't have any wrinkles in the surface of the shirt at all Now when the printer finishes printing the shirt, uh, it's going to eject the platen to the rear of the machine. Now Rip Pro actually gives you a choice um, of where you want the platen to finish when it's done. Uh, Viper's always going to uh, eject the platen to the back of the machine, uh, which works well for high speed production because you can go ahead and offload at the rear of the machine and go right to a, a heat press. But if you want, Rip Pro allows us to set a choice where it will rewind the platen back to the front of the machine. Uh, this helps out if you have a tight shop and you don't have a lot of room to work around the machine. Uh, you can actually have the platen rewind and come back to the front of the machine for offloading. Now, To begin the pre-treating process, what we want to do first is pre-press the shirt. This is going to basically flatten down the cotton, also flatten down the nap, the little cotton fuzzies that like to stick up, which can give us lots of little issues with consistency when printing. So we want to just go ahead and come over here to the heat press and lay our shirt down on the heat press. Go ahead and flatten it out, make sure there's no creases or wrinkles, get anything excess out of the way and then we want to go ahead and pull the uh, heat plate down onto the shirt and lock it into place. The idea here is just to iron the shirt. Uh, all we really need here is about 10-15 seconds and then we can go ahead and release and come up. The other thing this helps do too is get moisture out of the shirt. Uh, the more dry 
the shirt, the more the pre-treat will soak into the shirt, uh, which I, overall is going to help with the uh, washability. Now when pre-treating, uh, you can lay the shirt down on a flat surface and spray down on it. Ideally, it's best to have a raised platform, something the size of a platen or maybe even the size of the heat press bed. That way the excess material drops down out of the way and we're really only spraying the surface area that we want pre-treated. When we put this on the platen here uh, to get it raised up, first we want to pay close attention to three aspects of volume control for, for how much or how little we get on the shirt. The first is how slow or how fast we spray across the surface. Uh, the other factor too is how close or how far away we get. We generally want to be within about 10 to 12 inches of the surface that we're spraying. Uh, the third one here is the dial control for the volume of the sprayer. The sprayer that comes with the printer has a, a dial on the back of the trigger which inhibits the trigger from going any further. This is how we set the, the volume for the spray coming out of the sprayer. Now what we want to go ahead and do is start by getting our spray gun pointed just up in the area where we want to start. It's best to spray off of the platform and then actually let's brush across the uh, platform. So we'll start spraying just off the edge and come across and off the other side as we continue to go back in our motions. Alright, so let's begin here. Now when when you first pull this trigger in the first second or two you're just going to have air coming out of the spray gun so spray off to the side for a second or so wait for that spray to start coming out and then spray across the shirt be sure and pull the trigger all the way in and move across the surface of the shirt continue to go back and forth with horizontal direction then when you get to the end rotate your wrist and go up and down in a vertical motion. The whole idea through this whole process is to give ourselves a nice, even, consistent spray. Once we're finished spraying, we want to take a foam roller brush and roll down to press the pre-treat a little deeper into the shirt. It'll actually take that little bit of nap up on top and push it in. Now, if you start from the top and work your way down, continue with that motion, always starting from the top and going down to the bottom. Now we need to go ahead and take our shirt over to the heat press. We want to go ahead and lay the shirt down on the heat press like we did before to pre-press it, making sure we don't have any wrinkles or creases across the surface. Now we want to go ahead and use either a Teflon sheet or DTG release paper, but we don't want to use parchment paper for pre-treating. Parchment paper has a tendency to stick more. When we pull it up, it's going to pull the nap up. The release paper or the Teflon sheet has the smoothest surface and tends to give us the smoothest, flattest pre-treated surface. Now our times and temperatures for pre-treating and pressing. Our heat press should always be set at 340 degrees for everything that we do. When it comes to pre-treating, our time should be 20 to 30 seconds. Anything after 30 seconds, maybe 40 seconds, still yields a damp t-shirt. Well, that's a good indication that we've got too much pre-treat on our shirt. Now, once we're done here with pressing it, we will see a little hint of the pre-treat and the actual nap of the shirt pressed in, but that's okay. It's not going to be very noticeable at all once you're done with the whole job. Now, placing a dark shirt on the platen is really no different than putting a white shirt on the platen, uh, except it's far more critical not to touch the surface of the shirt. We've worked hard to get that nap and those little fibers flat, so we don't want to rub our hand across it to get it roughed up. Now, we tuck the, the shirt into the tuck lock just like we did with a white shirt. Go ahead and tuck the excess material underneath the tuck locks. If we're printing more than one shirt, we'll go ahead and get the second shirt on the on the second platen. We do it just like we did with the first shirt. We want to be careful not to let too much of the fabric of the other shirt drop down on the first shirt that we have on the platen. Go ahead and get the excess material underneath. Check our corners and make sure there's no points flaring up. Now just like always when loading we need to make sure that our, our platen, uh, platen straight edge is up against the rail in the bed. Now we go ahead and, and press forward to bring it into the printer and see the gap sensor. 
and press up to bring it up to the to the gap sensor so it'll set the proper gap now press load and now we've got it loaded now we're ready to go over to our graphic program or rip pro and and set up our job to print Now when the printer is finished printing the white underbase, the platen is going to eject to the rear of the printer uh, where it will sit for a second or two and then the conveyor belt is going to bring the platen back to the front of the machine. It's going to then automatically load the platen back into the machine and then it's going to go ahead and resume printing now the color layer on top of our white underbase. There's nothing we need to do mechanically here. We don't even need to touch the platen. In fact, we don't want to move the platen one bit or we will have registration issues. Uh, just like with printing a white shirt, 
it's no different here with a dark shirt uh, at the end of the print when it finishes printing the color layer it will eject the platen to the rear of the machine just like with a white shirt rip pro will allow us to uh, either leave the platen at the back of the machine where it finishes ejecting or rewind back to the front of the printer for offloading at the front of the printer Now when performing maintenance on the printer, it's a good idea to power the printer off. So go ahead and press power on the control panel and wait for the green light on top of the printhead unit to go off. Right, now that we have power off, you can release the printhead by pressing down the, the release lock. And down in here we've got the capping station which we can press on the back posts and manually move it back. Now to bring the wiper blade into place, this gear here, if we rotate this gear towards the front of the machine, we can manually move the wiper blade into position so we can clean it. Now be careful turning this gear. It's very easy to pop it off if you, if you try to force the gear, and if so, it'll drop down the slot and be hard to find. When cleaning, use only DTG cleaning solution. This solution is formulated for this ink and will be very forgiving on these rubber components over the long life of the machine. Now get the cleaning solution onto a paper towel and get it soaked really well. Now pull back on your capping station. For cleaning the wiper blade, the idea here is mainly just to keep this leading edge of the wiper blade good and clean and free of ink and work to clean the rubber seal that goes around the capping station pad. It's very important to keep these rubber seals clean otherwise when the printhead comes in and docks it may not form a good seal it might let air leak in and if we have air leak in we could have rapid clogging of the printhead nozzles. Make sure and get all four sides of the of the rubber seal cleaned good. If you want to check to see if the rubber seal is good and clean you can use your finger and run it along the the rubber seal and feel for any little bits or pieces of dried ink. Those two can cause problems with with the rubber seal forming a a good seal when the printhead docks. Uh, now we want to use a syringe and fill it up with a little bit of the cleaning solution and then we're going to actually take that and squirt a little bit here in the spit station. Uh, the spit station is this little funnel area where the print head will actually fire the nozzles and release some ink. Put a little bit of cleaning solution on the wiper blade and on the little channel or the, the base of the wiper blade to you know, help prevent the buildup of ink that occurs there. Next let's move over to the capping station and fill the capping station pad up with cleaning solution. Slowly that'll drain down into the pad of the capping station and then of course when we're done with the maintenance and we power the printer back on it will draw it down through. Now we need to pull the head over to the middle of the area and we need to come underneath here and clean the actual undercarriage of the printhead. Now it's important when cleaning this part that we avoid the face of the printhead. If we continue to clean the face of the printhead, we will wear out the coating that's on there. This Teflon coating is kind of what helps hold ink in the nozzles and helps the nozzles fire correctly. Now our main focus here on cleaning the undercarriage are these, these plastic ramps on either side of the printhead face. Because the wiper blade wipes across them, it'll leave ink on these little plastic ramps and hour by hour day by day inks just building up layer upon layer so every day we should come under here and clean this off especially after we've run a, a huge production run now also under the carriage here we need to clean the the back leading edge that metal scarf that goes around the face of the printhead the back side and then also we need to clean the front leading edge of the print head. Uh, the next thing we need to clean is the encoder strip. The encoder strip is this strip of data that runs in the front of the print head unit where the carriage goes back and forth. Now we can spray a little Windex on a paper towel and we can take and move the print head out of the way here. Start by gently pinching both sides of the encoder strip and run it along the encoder strip until we can get to a point where we can move the print head back in that area. Then start again, overlap where we've cleaned and wipe all the way across the rest of the encoder strip. Look at the paper towel that you've used and look for the residue on the paper towel. You want to keep doing this until you, you don't see any more residue on the, on the paper towel coming from the encoder strip. 
Now it's also a good idea to keep our conveyor belt clean. If we get a tremendous buildup of ink or dust over it over time, then it may not grip the underside of the platen very well. Uh, we can just use Windex to clean this off. We can start at the front of the machine and clean an area. Just press the forward button to move the cleaned area uh, towards the back of the machine and then continue to clean the sections as we go along. It's a good idea to keep the original bottles that the ink came in, uh, keep some empty bottles for this, uh, this point in time here where we might need to flush the printer. That way we can take any extra ink that we have, uh, pour it back into the bottles because we do need to use these bottles that are on the back of the machine as actual flushing solution bottles. First, start by unscrewing one of the bottles and pull the cap off and the inner tube out take a paper towel and wipe as much ink off of that inner tube as you can and then you can set it aside. Take the leftover ink that you might have in the bottle and pour it back into one of these uh, bottles, one of these original ink bottles that you saved. Now we want to put that aside because we do need to go and rinse these bottles out before we put any flush of solution on. then move on to the next bottle and do the same thing. Basically we want to repeat the process for all four CMYK bottles here. Get as much ink off the tube as we can, and lay it aside, pour the ink out of the bottle back into its original bottle, and then move on to the next color. Now after we've rinsed out the bottles real good, we want to take a paper towel and go inside the bottles and dry them out real well. We really don't want any, any residue from any tap water or anything like that to be left behind that could introduce some sort of a mineral into a line that, believe it or not, could be the result of clogging one nozzle in that line. Now fill these bottles up with flush and solution and then place them back on their spots and get the cap screwed down on. Remember the idea here is that we are basically filling the printer with flushing solution instead of ink. So it's the same type of procedure we would do with ink only with flushing solution. All right, now we're going to go over to the uh, WIMS system to flush it. The first thing, the most important thing to do here is determine which tube is the actual inlet, the one that feeds to the printhead that actually is pumping or drawing ink out of the bottle. The other one we need to find out returning ink back to the bottle. What we want to do is unscrew the cap while we have the WIMS pump actually running now be careful, we don't want to just yank it up, otherwise we might uh, pull the tube off to the side and end up having ink start squirting out. We just want to raise it up high enough to see which tube is actually trickling or, or percolating ink back into the bottle. Uh, then we'll know which is our inlet and which is our outlet. 
Okay, first thing we want to do is uh, unplug the the stir motor. And now we're going to go ahead and disconnect the uh, inlet tube. Now we can screw the cap back on here a little bit. Now we want to continue to leave the the outlet, the tube that returns ink back to the bottle. We want to leave that one still screwed on because what this is doing is is draining the white ink out of the WIM system and getting it back to the bottle. This whole circulation system actually takes a couple of minutes. So for the moment we disconnect the inlet tube and wait for that air to go all the way through the system and back, we're probably talking about two to three minutes before we, we see that we're finally got most of the white ink out of the, the system. Okay, now we can go ahead and disconnect the return tube. Now we actually have the complete bottle and whims free. We can go ahead at this time and unplug the whims pump so that we stop the circulation. And now that the bottle and, and the caps are free, we want to take those, empty the white ink out of the bottle back into its original ink bottle and then we're going to take and clean the white ink reservoir, the paddle, everything involved with the uh, container that holds the white ink. Now just like the color bottles, once we've cleaned the white ink container we need to get a paper towel in there and get it dried out real good. We don't want any any tap water left inside there. Even just drops could could give us issues with the white ink and, and the way white ink might react with it. Same goes true for the uh, the stirring paddle and the tubes. Let's get these things as dry as we possibly can before we go ahead and add flushing solution in here. Now we take the cap and go ahead and place it back on the reservoir. Get the tubes inside. And first we're going to connect the inlet, the one that's drawing solution out of this bottle that, that's taking it to the printhead. We're going to leave the one that returns ink back to the bottle disconnected. We're going to actually put this into some uh, waste bottle here so that when we turn the pump on and it starts to circulate this flushing solution, Instead of returning this nasty contaminated flushing solution back into the WIM system, we're actually going to let it pour into a waste bottle so that we can keep the flushing solution in the WIM system as clean as we possibly can. And now that we're holding our, our waste bottle here with our tube inside, uh, it's going to take it a few minutes to actually get uh, the solution really fully flowing through here. and and pumping through this tube and, and getting it cleared out so uh, we need to hold this here for just a little while. Now once we see that we've gotten the WIM system completely flush clean and that the solution that's coming through the tube and back to the uh, little waste bottle here that we're using, let's go ahead and take and connect it back to the the tube to return back to the bottle. Now that we've got everything flushed clean in the WIMS system, the circulation system, we can actually start to circulate the flushing solution uh, for the final part of our flushing which is going to be running uh, ink charges and power cleanings with the flushing solution so that we're now actually flushing the printhead. Okay, now that we have our system circulating flushing solution and we've got a uh, flushing solution in our, our CMYK bottles, we want to go ahead and run a power cleaning. So here's what we do. On the control panel, we want to go and press menu. Then we're going to press the forward button to scroll down. We're going to go until we find maintenance. Press menu to select maintenance. Then press forward to scroll down again until we see power cleaning which will say PWR cleaning. Go ahead and press menu to select that and now it's asking us do we wish to perform a power cleaning with a left for no and a right for yes. So we go ahead and press menu for yes for that right arrow key.
If you look back at the CMYK bottles and the tubes that actually feed the ink in there, you're going to see that the uh, solution is going to start to rise up these tubes and it's going to start to push the ink through and towards the printhead. During this power cleaning, we will see that a good portion of this CMYK tube system is going to get flushed out. Now we may need to run multiple of these because the idea here is to do this until we don't see any ink at all and that the flushing solution has completely pushed all of the CMYK ink out of the lines. Now what we really want to pay close attention to here now is the printhead area itself. Where the tubes are wrapping around and coming into the printhead and under the cover, we will see that uh, it's flushed some of it out, but we'll still see a yellowish haze, a magenta haze, a cyan haze, and definitely a black haze where we've still got ink pigment floating in there. So we're going to repeat these ink charges as often as we need to do until we see that completely clear. Basically, we don't want to be able to uh, be able to see the difference between the black tube, the cyan tube, the magenta and yellow. They should all look clear. They should all look the same. Once we see that we got the CMYK tubes clear, we're not quite finished yet. We're almost there though. We've got the ink delivery system flushed. We've got the WIM system flushed. We've got flush of solution going through everything all the way into the dampers, but we still have some traces of ink in the in the nozzles themselves and probably some in the filters of the dampers as well too. Uh, so our final step here is to do just regular old head cleaning cycles. Uh, I don't think it could actually hurt to do too many of these but if you want to do 10 or 20, 30 head cleaning cycles that's going to be fine. During the head cleaning cycle not only is the printer pump sucking and drawing this flush of solution through the nozzles but the printer itself is actually firing these nozzles and firing this flushing solution. Every single nozzle firing flushing solution is actually making sure we're getting every trace of ink pigment out of these nozzles. Now after we've done all of these head cleaning cycles to get the nozzles to really push and fire this flushing solution, we have one more method to check and see if we if we really flushed it good. We can take and empty out our waste bottle and clean it out really good, then go back and do several more head cleaning cycles, look in the waste bottle, swirl it around, and see what you get in the waste bottle. If it looks like flushing solution in the waste bottle, then you know you've got every trace of ink flushed out of there. If we still see a lot of cloudy, grayish, uh, you know, smoky colored, waste in there, you know, mixed with flush and solution, we know we need to keep going. We might even need to do another power cleaning or two. Um, but again, like I say, if you see flushing solution in that waste bottle and it looks like flushing solution, then we know we've flushed this printer out thoroughly.